Welcome to session number two in our course on the theology of evangelism. We are really excited about what God is doing in this course as we are seeking the heart of God. Today we are going to be talking specifically about the subject of the holiness of God. You see, the entire theology of God is wrapped up in the holiness of God. And when you're seeking the heart of God, of course, you discover that in the heart of the very essence of what God is all about, there is nothing but holiness. That's what his heart is full of. So holiness is the heart of God. I want to do a bit of review with you about what we talked about yesterday, just to re-emphasize and to put the whole thing in your thinking again. Well, we're talking about seeking the heart of God. That evangelism, when you're talking about the theology of evangelism, is really seeking the heart of God. That you don't evangelize uh, out of your own passion. You don't evangelize out of your own training. You evangelize because you have found the heart of God. And when you discover the heart of God, there begins to spill through you the very essence of his life. And he becomes the burning passion of evangelism. If you focus on evangelism, you will not evangelize. You will get burned out. You will get discouraged. People won't respond like you think they ought to. You will learn one technique, then you'll know another technique, and on and on it goes until you will not evangelize at all. If you discover the heart of God, you will then begin to burn with the passion of God, and we will not be able to keep you from evangelizing. So you see, evangelism is a byproduct of seeking the heart of God. Now, you'll remember that seeking is not a doing thing. Seeking is, in, seeking is an internal burning passion that says, oh, I want to know the heart of God. It's a hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And I trust that you have been praying and that you've been open for God to create within you this deep internal passion. I, I promise you this, if you ever see the face of Jesus as he really is, you will never be able to get away from him. He will come after you. you. You will be haunted by that face. You will not be able to blink ever again. You will want to stare at that face. You will want to know him in intimacy. You will want to know his heart if you ever see him. I trust that he is revealing himself to you. And as he reveals himself to you, deep within there will begin to spill this overwhelming desire to know the heart of God. And you will go on the journey of discovering his heart. Oh, that I might know him more. Deep within my soul, I want to know him. And I'm looking in his face, and it creates within me these overwhelming cries that say, I want to know you more. Oh, I want to know you more. Oh, I want to know you more. Deep within my soul, I want to know you. And I would give my final breath, dear Jesus, to know you in your death and your resurrection. Oh, I want to know you more. Seeking the heart of God. So we're defining evangelism in terms of seeking the heart of God until his heart begins to spill through you and the natural result of that will be evangelism. You will not be able to keep from doing it. Now if you are truly seeking the heart of God, what you're going to discover is that at the essence of finding his heart, you are going to know holiness. What a term it is, holiness. And it is the overall term of everything we're going to be talking about in theology, the holiness of God. For our discussion in that, I want you to turn to the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 12, because there is a great discussion in this chapter on the issue of holiness. And holiness especially as it is found in God, because you see, there is no holiness outside of him. He is all there is. Holiness is what he is, and what he is is holiness. Now, there are many interchangeable terms, so do not get trapped into terminology. We talk, of course, about the cross style. This is a cross style lesson. The style of the cross is at the heart of everything that's going on in God. And when we talk about cross style, we're really talking about death to yourself, and we're talking about allowing the person of God to begin to do through you. We're not talking about you doing, we're talking about him doing. We're talking about you admitting, I can't, but he can, and I'm going to let him. We're talking about you're not adequate, he is adequate, and you're going to let him flow through you. That is the essence of faith. Faith is saying, I'm not adequate to pull this off. But I know he is, so I'm going to trust him instead of trusting myself. And that is the very action of faith. 
Faith is invoking the activity of the second party. He's the second party, you're the first party. You know that you're not adequate, so you are constantly invoking his activity in your behalf. And he is doing for you, through you, and you never ever do anything for him. You always allow him to do through you. You become the glove into which he puts his hand. You become the skin that he begins to wear, cross style, dead to yourself, crucified with Christ. Now Christ is flowing his resurrected life through you and he is manifesting himself so instead of you living it's his life cross style do you realize that that whole concept that term cross style is the identical same thing as holiness holiness cross style same thing holiness of God see when you get at the heart of God what you find is that there beats within God this cross style this is the way he thinks this is his perspective. This is the way he operates. This is the instinctive internal attitude of God himself that flowing through his being constantly is this, is this style which springs from the source of the cross that it literally is at the heart of all that God is. So when you find the heart of God, you're really finding the heart of the cross. The cross has been planted in the heart of God. What we're really interested in is that you and I might experience that cross. Paul said, I bear in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the cross has literally been planted deep within me, and since it is deep within me, it is now the source of everything that is within me, and I think in terms of the cross, of pouring my life out. That is holiness. Holiness, cross style. Another term that's synonymous with holiness, cross style, is perfect love. Wesley called holiness perfect love. It was an internal dynamic love for God that just burned with such passion that you just loved God with your whole being and all divided motives were gone and you had one single motive and that was to love him and him alone. He becomes the sole love of your life. And of course, that naturally spills out then into love for your neighbor. So you love God and all oh, the love of God. When you love him with your whole being and experience his heart, it has to spill out in evangelism, loving your neighbor as yourself. So evangelism is natural. It's the offspring of holiness itself. So holiness, cross-style, perfect love. Hey, all are, all are the same thing. We're talking synonymous terms for the same overwhelming concept which is found at the heart of God. Now, the scripture has some definite things to say about holiness that's really important for you to get, and I only want to give you one concept in relationship to this, which will launch us into our study on the theology of evangelism. Chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews. Now, he's given some overwhelming truth in these pages that have gone before. For instance, there is found in verse 9, the blood chapter. Chapter 9 is a chapter of nothing but about the blood of Jesus. Anytime you want to study uh, the blood of Jesus, you automatically go to Hebrews chapter 9. It's all over that chapter. Then after presenting to us about the blood of Jesus, he moves us to chapter 10, which is all about the outspill of obedience. In other words, when you have experienced the blood of Christ, what is going to take place but the natural flow of obedience? And obedience is definitely required in relationship with God, which is, again, the whole essence of holiness, that I love him so much I never want to hurt him. I want him to flow through me. I want to walk in the obedience, listening to him. So chapter 9, blood chapter. Chapter 10, obedience chapter. And then chapter 11 is faith chapter. Oh, we've already talked about faith. It's invoking the activity of the second party. He's the second party. I'm the first party. And I'm never acting on my own, always calling upon him, trusting him more than I trust myself. So that faith is what takes obedience and spills it into action. It's faith that literally moves me to trust him and him alone so that the blood now begins to spill through me and accomplish what he wants. Now, when you come to chapter 12, you see that he brings up or adds to an additional subject. It is the subject of discipline. Now, for most of us, discipline is a nasty word. 
We don't like the idea of discipline because it smells of doing something I really don't want to do. It's grinding my teeth. I'll be glad when this is over. It has to do with duty. It's those kinds of things. So it has a negative connotation. Discipline. But that's not the kind of discipline he's talking about. For see, if you're getting in on what we're really talking about in terms of cross-style, then we're not talking about self-discipline. We're talking about spirit discipline, the Holy Spirit disciplining your life. This is not a self-inflicted deal whereby you accomplish this. This is a death to yourself, a finding the heart of God, a being involved in the thrust of his very being and allowing him now to discipline your life until the Holy Spirit begins to spill through you discipline that is way beyond self-discipline. It's the discipline of the Holy Spirit in your life. Now begins to talk about several different kinds of discipline or we might say the discipline of the Holy Spirit which has several different aspects. One of the aspects is found in verse 1 and 2 of this tremendous chapter. Now, verse 1 and 2 of chapter 12 are probably familiar verses to you. When you look at verse 1, he says, therefore, and of course that immediately tells you that what he's going to say to you is based upon all that's already been taking place or given in chapter 11. In chapter 11 is the hall, a hall, a mark of, of, of fame and faith. It's all the people of faith who have been standing firm in days gone by. And here is the great place of where all those of faith in Old Testament hours have been now investigated and found that the secret of their very lives was faith itself. For instance, there is uh, Abel in verse 4, who by faith offered a better sacrifice. There's Abraham in verse 8, who obeyed by faith. See, these are the great action men of faith from the Old Testament hour. Now, as you come to verse 1, you'll notice he says, Therefore, since all of these people by faith have won victory, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, which means he's actually talking about all these people of faith in chapter 11. And they are witnesses. They are watching, as it were. He calls us to lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and running with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. So here is the great picture of an athlete. Now, the picture he's giving us here is the discipline of concentration. The discipline of the concentration as pictured in an athlete who is in a great race. Can you see this individual? He's not waving to anybody in the stands. He's not concerned about what he's going to eat when this is all over. See, he's got one thing on his mind, putting one foot in front of the other and winning this race. That this is the whole entire focus of his life the discipline of concentration. What is our discipline? Looking unto Jesus. Now in the terms that we have been talking about, we are talking about seeking the heart of God. Ah, could you come under the discipline of the Holy Spirit until you would have one focus, one drive, one passion, and that would be seeking the heart of God. This would be your whole deal. Your whole life would fall under the discipline of this one overwhelming focus. The Holy Spirit can do that for you. And I want you to get involved in that, looking unto Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, he moves us from the discipline of concentration, the discipline of the Holy Spirit upon our lives in concentration, to verses 3 and down through verse 10. And it is the discipline of suffering. Now, all of us have gone through suffering. We've all of ex we have all experienced that in our lives. But I want you to know that in this passage, he has several things to say about suffering, and he specifically talks about one type of suffering. Now, often we have said, oh, yes, I have had suffering in my life. It's God disciplining me. But the suffering we talked about was some natural catastrophe, like uh, some storm blew our house down, and it's a discipline, it's a cross, I must bear it, and God is disciplining me, and I'll learn something from it. Now, probably there is some discipline involved in that, but that's not the discipline he's talking about here. 
In fact, he uses words like chastisement, God chastening us, and he talks about it in terms of a father and son relationship. And you'll note, if, for instance, in verse 5 he says, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you us to you as to sons. And then he gives this quotation uh, from Proverbs 3, verse 11 and 12. He says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Now, as he goes on in this paragraph, he talks to us about how it's the very proof that we are sons. For when God disciplines us, oh, do you know what that means? It, he means he loves us and that he's involved in our lives. And he only does it for one purpose, and that is our own improvement, because he has a desperate desire to help us. And he comes and disciplines us, chastens us for the sake of our own benefit. Now, as you get down to the details of this, you begin to see in verse 7 that he says that God does deal with us as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Hey, no decent father just lets his son do what he wants to. No, a father disciplines his son. But look at verse 8. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and you're not really a son. So this is the very proof of your sonship. 9, verse 9, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Now, the human father, of course, he is often ignorant, and he often disciplines his son with a discipline that isn't quite the way it ought to be. Now, God never does that. God, God is omniscient. God is all-knowing. God always disciplines you correctly. And sometimes an earthly father would discipline you out of selfish motivation because he was embarrassed. But, oh, your heavenly father never, never, never does that. No, never. In fact, look at verse 10, which is really where we want to land in our study. For they indeed, that means your earthly fathers, for they, your earthly fathers, indeed for a few days chastened you as seemed best to you. But he, oh, your heavenly father, chastened you for your profit that you may be partakers of his holiness. Did you get that phrase? Underline it in your Bible. Partakers of His holiness. Why does God the Father chasten you? There's only one reason why He does this. It's because He has this burning desire that you might profit. In other words, He wants to help you. He's pushing you in a direction. And what does He want to help you about? That you may become a partaker of His holiness. It would be good for you to study the word partaker. Oh, that you might join in. It's not yours, but that you might join in and partake him in part of that which is his and his alone. In fact, it's interesting when you come to the word holiness here. The word holiness here is a noun. It's in the noun form, but it's a special kind of noun in the Greek, in the original language of the New Testament. When the writer of the Hebrews wrote this, he picked out a special, special word a special form of the word holiness, a noun that is called a quality noun. And this quality noun, everywhere you see it, always means one thing, that the quality that's being spoken about belongs exclusively to the one that is being referred to in the passage or in the sentence. In other words, the quality that's being talked about here is the quality of holiness. And he is talking about God the Father who wants us to partake in his holiness. So he uses the word that says, this holiness belongs exclusively, exclusively. Hey, I'm talking exclusively to God and God alone.
That's what this word means. So we're calling this transcended holiness. This is holiness that's way beyond you. This is holiness that's not within your grasp. This is holiness that's not something you can pull off. This is holiness that's not within the realm of your ability. This is holiness that will never be yours as if you have it on your own. This is a holiness that belongs to God and God alone. This is not a cheap holiness of following rules. This is not a cheap holiness of something you perform out of your own self-discipline. This is a holiness that comes from God and God alone. This is a holiness that belongs exclu exclusively to Him. He alone is holy and no one has ever been holy apart from Him. I cannot overemphasize this to you. There is no way to stress this way too much that when you think of holiness, you have to think of Him. There is no holiness outside of God. God alone is holy. You must never get into the framework of thinking that holiness or anything that comes from God is something that He has and hands it to you and you go off and use it saying, thank you God, but God's over there and you're over there using what He's given to you. That's never the way it is. Not, oh, not in what God has and in what He has to give to you. He has nothing to give to you in, in terms of something that's apart from Him. The only thing He has to give to you is who He is. And then you derive all of this from Him. So holiness belongs exclusively to God. And if you ever get it, it will be that which will be derived from the person of God. Oh, we're back to the concept of seeking the heart of God. See, seeking the heart of God is so essential because holiness only spills out of getting into the heart of God. When you find the heart of God, then coming from that is the dynamic of holiness or the cross style or the perfect love that spills you out to your world. So God alone is holy. No one else is holy or ever will be. He alone is holy. And holiness comes exclusively from Him and Him alone. Now you see this all the way through the scriptures. And in your class session after this video, you are going to begin investigating some scriptures that reveal this to you. Let me give you a hint of those scriptures. For instance, Moses and the burning bush. Here's Moses who is finding a bush on the hillside that is not is being burned but not being consumed very unusual he's looking at it a voice begins to speak it's the voice of god and the voice commands him take off your shoes you're standing on holy ground now, I'm really glad I wasn't Moses and wasn't there at that time because I'm sure I would have looked at that bush and said, Ah, you're kidding me. This is not holy ground. That's ridiculous. I was just over this ground yesterday with my sheep. Hey, uh, this is good old mountain ground. You pick it up. It gets underneath your fingernails. There's nothing holy about this ground. This is just mountain ground. This ground never goes to church. This ground never prays. This ground never ties this money. This ground is just mountain ground. There's no way this ground could be holy. I'm sure that God, speaking from the bush, would say to me, Get your shoes off. You're standing on holy ground. Well, it wasn't holy yesterday. It's holy today. Why is it holy today? Because God is on the scene. And when God is on the scene, the ground gets holy. You can count on it every time. Listen, if you go downtown and you accidentally bump into God, get your shoes off because the ground around him is going to be holy. If you go downtown and you accidentally step on some holy ground, immediately yank your shoes off because you know God is present. Because wherever God is, the ground gets holy. And wherever the ground is holy, God is present. And it's all derived from his person because he alone is holy. There is no holiness outside of him. He alone transcended holiness. 
Now you see this played out through the entirety of the Old Testament. This concept is so vividly described for us. It's vividly described in the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark was a box that had been made by human hands and you're going to be looking at the scriptures of all of the things that were a part of the building of that Ark and the tabernacle. But all of a sudden the Ark that had been handled by hands of men suddenly became overwhelmingly holy and a man reached out and touched it and dropped dead because you don't put your hand on the holiness of God. And why was the ark holy one time and not holy another? Because there came a time when God descended upon the ark and when he is present, things get holy. Men in the Old Testament became holy men of God. Why? Because God through his spirit descended upon them. Oh, if that was true in the Old Testament, when God handpicked some select men to come and indwell them for the purpose of leadership through His Spirit, and they became holy men. What on earth do you think would happen in this hour in the New Testament age when the dispensation of the Holy Spirit is upon us and you and I can be filled with the essence of God and He can begin to wear us like skin? Would we not become holy? Only it would never be our holiness. It would always be the holiness of God because there is no holiness outside of Him. He alone is holy. He alone is holy. Oh, get that down. There is no holiness outside of the person of God. He alone is holy. So the holiness that we're talking about, the cross style, the living of the cross in our, in our day, the love that burns and spills out to the lives of others is never ours. See, this is not a natural love. This is a supernatural love. This is who He is. This is why we must seek the heart of God. For it's in finding the heart of God that through us this evangelism, through us this style of the cross, through us this perfect love can begin to be known. We must know Him and Him alone. So our goal, see, is not to evangelize. Our goal is to know Him. And if you know Him, you will not be able to help yourself. This will just begin to happen. It's the holiness of God, transcended holiness, all that He is. What an overwhelming concept. Would you be willing to expose yourself to the holiness of God and all that that would do within you? Do you realize that the holiness of God would begin to burn through you and would change you forever? That the holiness of God, if you would allow Him to take over, would do in you the corrections until there would be no blockade to the flow of His life? Would you be open to the change that the very indwelt holiness of God would bring about in your life? I trust you will. In fact, I want you to pray about it. Seek the heart of God in total openness. He will do in you what needs to